So I came here today to share with you something that's close to my heart. So here's this purpose thing. It's seemingly the new silver bullet. We're all supposed to find it, that it may give us joy and satisfaction in return. But, you know, are we actually looking for purpose itself? I would argue we don't want purpose. We want the feeling associated with purpose, namely joy and satisfaction. And I would also argue that most of us search that purpose from their heads. And if you search from your head, you're much more likely to find a mental construct. And a mental construct is unstable. It's ever-changing. It can never truly be yours. And therefore, the joy and satisfaction you get in return might also be a bit unstable. So I'm standing here today to make the case that living a purposeful life can actually be just around the corner. And it's actually pretty easy to find and it's there for everyone. And as we are not searching a mental concept anymore, but a feeling, I would also argue that we should add our hearts to the equation and to the search. But you know, we humans, we love to search for the holy grail that it may give us joy and satisfaction at a later point in time. And that's exactly what I did. So um, when I was a kid, um, about, you know, I had figured out what I wanted to be really early on. I wanted to be a professional football player. I was like one of those baby sea turtles when they hatch. You know, they already know they need to make it to the sea. It's their instincts what tell them to do this. And they just, they just go. They don't look left. They don't go right. They just go. And then one week before the summer vacation, I was nine years old, I lost that purpose. Our teacher had gathered us in a circle of chairs and he asked, where are you guys going to go on summer vacation? And I knew that my great mom and dad and I, we were going to go camping in nature. And there was nothing better to me than camping in nature. And lots of countries hovered around the room until this one voice said, I'm going to go to Disney World. And he said it in that particular voice. It was arrogant. Well, in retrospect, maybe unintentionally arrogant, but it was arrogant. And it kind of struck me like lightning. And I felt, oh, I also want to go to Disney World. And, you know, all of a sudden, camping wasn't cool at all anymore. And my parents weren't in a position to take me to Disney World at the time. So at night, I lay in my bed and I took two vows. First of all, I'm going to make it to Disney World. And secondly, in order to be able to go as often as I possibly could, I was going to become richer than any parent of any kid in my school. So I hustled. I became a hustler, turned entrepreneur, turned investor in my mid-twenties, I'd sold one of the companies I'd built and I'd made enough money not having to work for a while. The little turtle had arrived in water. And was I happy? No, actually quite far from it. I was miserable. By having arrived at my destination, having made money, I had lost my purpose. The little turtle had looked left and right, it had compared itself, and it was following a borrowed concept. Everything that I had created was created with the sole purpose of making money. It was stripped of any meaning. And then my wife, at one point, handed me this book. It was called How to Change the World. It was a compilation of entrepreneurs that had created companies that make the world a better place. And I started to read in it, and something in me started to feel lighter, and I felt inspired, and it ignited the spark within me that then lit this huge fire, and I felt I wanted to take everything that I'd learned as an entrepreneur and as an investor and put it towards stuff that mattered. I wanted to be an impact venture capitalist. But the problem was it was 2007, we just slid into a financial crisis, investors weren't looking for impact, actually impact investing didn't exist at the time, founders were cautious, the money from the exit was largely gone. The brutal truth was we had 10,000 euros back on our bank account, we had no stable income and our first baby on the way. We were gonna last three months at the most. And you know what? For the first time in my life, I actually felt rich because I'd found my true purpose in life. And something in me told me, you're going to make it anyhow. So I gathered a few early believers and my co-founder, and we set out to raise this big fund. And we had two problems. First of all, we didn't know any wealthy people. And secondly, our pitch kind of sucked. It went like, Hey, give us a million, we'll invest it into companies that make the world a better place. No, there are no good, really, really good examples yet, but maybe we can return some of the money eventually back to you. And of course, we didn't raise all the money we wanted, but we decided to kick off anyway. 
And one thing that we'd learned from the fundraising was that we needed to create an example that everybody would understand. So we co-created this company called Oticon. And Oticon is an IT consulting company, and it works with a special kind of consultants. They're all Asperger autists. And I'm generalizing here, but the brain of an Asperger autist functions beautifully because it's really interested in great levels of detail and it has pattern recognition of the charts. Of course, there's some negative conditions that come with Asperger autism, so many of them are unemployed, but we thought if we could just create a structure, an environment in which they could flourish and where they could turn their disabilities into superpowers, we would have a really well-functioning business here. And that's exactly what happened. So the company convinced a lot of clients and it grew and it grew internationally. And when it grew into the UK, Richard Branson, the famous entrepreneur, became an investor with his group. And he wrote this beautiful article saying three companies that I admire the most was Virgin Money, Body Shop, and Alticon. And impact investing, something we had co-pioneered at Ananda Ventures, my firm, all of the sudden became mainstream and our level of ambition rose and we started to invest into everything from 3D printed bionic prosthesis for children with limb differences to satellites that protect the world from forest fires. We had become impact unicorn hunters. And you know what had happened? I had listened to my heart for the first time and I believe the heart is actually a quite powerful tool. So I'm not a scientist, but I've done quite a bit of research. The heart has a brain in its own right. It's made up of 40,000 neurons that communicate with the brain, and there's actually more info flowing from the heart to the brain than the other way around. And scientists at the reputable Heart Math Institute have found that positive feelings in our heart can actually unlock other perceptual areas in our brain, and this is the place where problems get solved creatively. This is the place of out-of-the-box creativity and true inspiration. And some of the greatest achievers of our time seem to have known it. Steve Jobs once famously said, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They already know what you want to become in life. Everything else is secondary. So I recalled, by reading this book and listening to my heart, it felt lighter, it was my heart talking to me all the way, and all I had done was follow its calling. But you know, after these moments of wow, we humans kind of fall back into our old treadmill, and I applied everything I'd learned in the past, like pushing, pulling, fighting, competing, to my newly found purpose. And somehow, I'd lost my joy and satisfaction along the way, because I think I hadn't embodied what I'd found. So I felt strangely detached from my heart and my brain took over and it's like, hey, Johannes, let's embark on another journey to find your true purpose in life. I said, no, you know, it just feels wrong. <laughs> and that built so much tension up in my body that I felt that I had to release it and boxing just seemed to be the right thing to do. So I was going to go, you know, boxing, release some tension, toughen up, you know, all of that. So a friend gave me this address to a gym and when I opened the door, a former world boxing champion greeted me friendly at the door. So far, so good. And we went downstairs and I followed her down the steps and I was shocked. The whole place was complete mayhem. There were young people and old people and children, teenage children watching telenovelas and there were left wing and right wing and lots of animals and everybody was treated the same way and everything beautifully structured itself around the gravitational force of her kindness. And that made me think, so how can you become a world boxing champion and be kind at the same time? And I found this to be true for many other fighters I got to hang out with. They're actually quite kind people. And I believe it is because boxing is this accelerated learning path in life. How do we learn? We learn through feedback. And feedback in boxing comes in the form of punches, right? So punches. We feel them on our skin, they bruise us, and we need to react, we need to adapt, right? And the same thing is true for life. So life throws all these punches at us, and ideally we don't become tougher, but by embracing these punches we actually become softer, we build our resilience, that opens our heart and will help us to bring our heart into our daily actions. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to bring my heart into my daily action as a venture capitalist. So I went back to my team and say, hi guys, I discovered this thing called kindness. I think we're already doing it here, and it should be our core value. And everybody's like kind of agreed, 
uh, but let's not put it on our website, Johannes, you know, because we're not going to be considered strong partners. And I said, well, I'm coming just from that gym, and I learned that strength and kindness don't contradict each other, and I want this to be true, so let's prove it. So we flew out to London to meet two of the greatest entrepreneurs the city had to offer, and we wanted to back them. Problem was, everybody else did too. So I tried my new pitch of kindness. I told the founders how we build relationships on the basis of kindness, how you know, kindness sparks creativity, and that's, again, good for performance and all of that. And while I was talking, I kind of felt insecure. And I looked to my left, and I saw my associate sinking deeper and deeper into a chair, thinking, oh, thanks, Johannes, you just kind of completely blew that deal. And when I'd finished, I was unsure, so I looked into the round, and it was a bit of silence and, 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 and tension there, and it was 10 seconds, 20 seconds, I don't know, an eternity, until one of the founders started to unbutton his shirt and ro slowly rolling his sleeve up, and then he showed me his elbow, and on the elbow, there was a tattoo in Sanskrit and, it, and I said, what does it mean? And he said, it means kindness. It's my core value in life. It's from where I draw my strength. So the elbow of kindness not only you know, became the beginning of a true great partnership, but it also became my new favorite punch. So the little turtle had turned into a ninja turtle. And I think you know, being kind in business doesn't mean you're naive or a loser. You just say what needs to be said but you do it in a kind way. And I think that's true for many other hard qualities like empathy or compassion. And I try to apply these qualities in other areas in my life, as a son, as a father of three great children, as a, as a husband. And I wanted to apply it to the simplest tasks because, because lots of these tasks are actually quite simple, right, that we need to do every day. So, you know, can you be patient? Can you be full of empathy? while you change the tenth diaper in a day. And you know what I found? I found gratitude, I found humility, and I found joy, and I found satisfaction right next door, even in the simplest things, just simply by putting my heart into it. And I recently calculated, I must have changed 5,000 diapers in my life, um, which is almost like an entire room. And that, unfortunately, doesn't make you a wise turtle. So I, I have not arrived yet. I'm not that wise turtle yet. I've not figured it all out. But there's a few things that I've learned. So first of all, I believe you can find your purpose in life by searching from your brain. But the way there is going to be a bit bumpy and the joy and satisfaction you might get in return is not as reliable as if you were putting your heart into the search. Then you might find your true purpose in a more direct way and the joy and satisfaction you might get is more stable. But the most important thing is, if we put our heart into our daily actions, into everything we do, we will find joy and satisfaction right next door. And if we feel joyful, and if we feel satisfied, it's much easier for us to again be motivated to put more heart. So in the end of the day, this is a virtuous cycle. So, you know, I found what I wanted to do in my life by listening to my heart. But I started to love what I do since I'm doing it from the heart. All I'm doing is to use the heart's intelligence. That's my holy grail. And, you know, I'm not a meditation teacher. I'm a practitioner. And the idea worth spreading today is not everything I just talked about. The idea worth spreading is actually a little exercise. So would you be open to try this with me, to try to connect with your heart? It's a very simple exercise. So all we're going to do is we're going to breathe into a heart and we're going to invite a heart quality into this. Are you ready? Yeah? So we're going to try this. So pick one of those heart qualities from the sheet here. So it's quite simple. Joy, care, kindness, something that resonates with you. You could also go for forgiveness or love, which is a bit more advanced, I'd say. And those of you who want to close your eyes, close your eyes or keep them open as you wish. And slowly breathe into your heart. Breathe a little bit deeper than you usually would. Your heart sits close to where your lungs are, so you should spot it easily. And now, invite your heart quality into your heart and feel it there while you breathe into your heart. Feel joy, care, Kindness. Feel it in your heart while you breathe into your heart. 
And now allow your heart quality to expand within your heart. Stay there. And allow it to expand beyond your heart. Keep breathing. Don't go into your head. Breathe into your heart. A few more breaths. And when you're ready, those of you who have closed your eyes, you can open it back up. So congratulations, you've just connected to your heart. Your heart is your true compass in life. It can help you to find your purpose in life. If you put it into your daily actions, you will find joy and satisfaction just around the corner and it will ultimately help you to live a purposeful life. Thank you for listening to me and your heart.